Referring to the incident mentioned in the life and teachings of the Masters of the Far East, where Emau separated the jackals that were fighting over the carcass of an animal, Emau said, It is not the self that you see, but only the God self that does the work. He meant to convey that when you get away from the fear of the animal and project the God self, there is peace and harmony. And they came together and ate their meal in perfect harmony instead of fighting. This is the theory back of our experience in walking through fire. The masters told us afterwards that we had raised our va vibration to such an extent that there was no conflict between us and the fire. There was perfect harmony and oneness. We clearly saw the fire raging all around us, but we felt no heat or discomfort. Our clothes were not even scorched. This experience has quite recently been duplicated in London by a young Hindu yogi under the severest scientific test conditions. Pictures of this incident were shown in America on one of the newsreels, and Edwin C. Hill, famous news commentator, wrote at some length upon the subject. Copies of this comment were mailed to 100 teachers conducting classes on these lessons. The life of the masters is simply the God life. They always put it, life is light. The movement we express light, I mean, the moment we express light, life emanates. If you live the life, then you will know, and that knowing is complete. It is not a life of asceticism or apartness. It is a life and light of unity in wholeness. Anyone may break this seeming bondage to a condition that is not godly by simply letting go of the bondage completely. That was our training from boyhood on. If a discordant condition came into our surroundings, we let go of it completely. The masters sometimes go for hundreds of days without eating. They are not bound in any way. But when they do not eat outwardly, they do feed upon the prana, our spiritual substance that is all about them. They take in prana substance, and it is assimilated for the direct and complete sustenance of the body. Plants feed upon prana, and when man uses the vegetables for food, he takes in prana also. He can take it directly even more readily than the plants and vegetables do, if he will. It would not be the part of wisdom for the Western world to discard the Bible in favor of the Blankva Jitta. Our Bible is of greater importance to the Western world, for we do not understand the Banglava Jitta. The latter is best, however, for the East. The West could, with profit, read the Banglava Jitta as it would obviate the necessity of wading through the folklore and the mistranslations of the Bible. The Banglava Jitta has taken all that out. The Vendetta philosophy is most, in most instances, instances is the best exposition of the teachings of the masters. Many people get a more simplified thought and can assimilate these thoughts through the Vedas. Then they go on to the Vedantic teachings. The reason those of the West have difficulty in understanding spiritual things is that the Western consciousness has always been an evasion of principle for the reason that they do not know what principle meant. They even misled themselves largely by the acceptance of their philosophers, teaching that principle is an unknown quantity. The mastermind knows what principle is, but so can we accept principle and know what it means. We must accept the goal toward which we are working, or we do not work at all. You cannot go into India with a spirit of egotism, selfishness, and design and get anything out of India any more than you can in these states get anything from these lessons from the Bible or any other source of truth. There is nothing in truth compatible with these attitudes. You get out of India whatever you take to India. It is not a matter of going into India at all. It is an ever-present state as it, it is a ever-present state is that you can receive it. It is not a matter of going to India, studying the Bible or the Blankva Jitta. It is letting go of all these confusions 
that infest the mind and the upset conditions resulting therefrom. Then one may get a great spiritual uplift from the Bible or any other source. We are beginning to see that we take from the Bible what we take to the Bible. The very determination to get the very meaning out of the book will open its secrets to us to some extent. If we read the Bangla Jitta or any other book, we must take the same attitude toward it. There is, of course, nothing in the Bible that is not interpreted in the Bangla Jitta, the Mahara, Bharata, and the Vedas. That is where all the knowledge that is contained in the Bible came from. Hmm, a lot of people don't know that. The next chapter is man. As in the preceding lesson, it was impossible to study the nature of God without including man. So in this lesson, it will be impossible to consider man without a further study of God. The one presupposes the other, and they are inseparable. It is impossible to have a king without a kingdom, and it is impossible to have a kingdom without a king. It is inconceivable to imagine a creator without his creation, and certainly there could be no creation without a creator. They are but the two aspects of a single thing, and without the one there could not be the other. Man is therefore an indispensable part of the universal whole. The master's thought of man is that he is in his true estate, always active, and is that through which principle works or comes into manifestation. As they often put it, man projecting God, man becoming God, the very ideal of all perfection, God selective but completely universal. Selection evidently came about through man's thought entirely. The master's thought is always that man must make the selection, but in that he can never carry that selection out of the whole or out of complete principle or spirit. And that means, of course, that man never does get away from his true being or true origin. Every man is his own determining factor. Every man is his own determining factor, and that factor is always absolutely one with principle. Never separated, never dependent upon anything but principle. Man as man can never be a completely independent organism, for he is inseparably united with the whole. How could he remove himself out of infinity? He only imagines his isolation, and that imagination is the sole source of his limitation. It is purely imaginary. The extent of his free will or right of selection cannot be carried beyond his imagination, for, in fact, he is always united in and with his source. He only needs to rid himself of his vain imaginings and accept the inevitable, and he is at once in his rightful place with the universal system. He is king only in the sense that he has the privilege of carrying out the laws of the kingdom, and any king who disregards the laws of his kingdom does not remain king for long. Kingship is subject to the laws of the kingdom, just as are the sub subjects, and they are all units in a single system, with the law superseding all at all times. Only through the binding influences of the law does the kingdom remain in har an harmonious unit. Man is triune, but that trinity is never separated. It is always one. You understand all the attributes of man if you understand man. The Greeks knew this and expressed it in their statement, Man, know thyself. It is very evident that we have not begun to know ourselves, our importance, our divinity. Divinity meaning, of course, that man is a part of the whole and, as such, does know all and is the all in manifestation. There can be no triangles unless the three lines which forms its sides are joined together in unity. Unless they are joined, they are only three lines and not a trinity at all. The trinity is dependent upon unity, and their unity is the trinity. Man's business is not to dissect himself until he understands his trinity, which could only be diversity. Man is progressing back to his father's house.